Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Innes McLeod. Good afternoon and welcome to InnoTri. And welcome to the second sense maker of the week. And it's all about quantum, led by Anna Fan. Anna is a member of IBM Research with a focus on multidisciplinary science. She trained as an experimental particle physicist. And after being part of the team that discovered the Higgs boson at CERN in Switzerland, she joined IBM to work on data science. She now investigates algorithms and applications of near-term quantum computers. Please give a warm round of applause to Anna Fan. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for joining me here at the Inner Tribe Discovery Zone at Cybos. I'm Anna Fan, a research scientist at IBM Research, based in Australia, an hour south in Melbourne. And I'm delighted to be here to talk to you about the possible applications of quantum computing. Personally, when I was an undergrad, I couldn't decide to study computer science or physics. So this topic, which is a combination of the two, is really, really fascinating to me. Thinking about the limitations of our current classical computers and the potential possibilities of our future quantum ones. Today, I'll start by giving a brief introduction and motivation to quantum computing before describing the quantum computing program at IBM. And at the end, I'll give you a little glimpse of a couple of possible applications we've been exploring with some collaborators in the finance industry. So what is quantum computing? Quantum computing is a completely different computing paradigm. We're not just taking the same programs and same applications that we run on today's computers and running them on different hardware. We're completely reimagining what it means to compute. We're computing with different properties of matter, quantum mechanical properties like superposition and entanglement. And to do this, we take the problem we want to solve, we encode it into a complex state, and then we manipulate that complex state to drive it towards a solution. It's a very, very different way of computing. To make an analogy, think about car travel. You're essentially traveling on a 2D surface. And you, can't, you can drive, well, if you really want to, you can drive from Melbourne to Sydney. But you can't do things like going from New York to Sydney. Now think about air travel, three-dimensional. With just this one extra degree of freedom, this one extra dimension, we can do things which were completely impossible before. This could be the magnitude of change between our current classical computers and our future quantum ones. To give you an idea about the different difference between classical and quantum computers, think about that caffeine molecule in that delicious tea or coffee that you've probably had many cups of today. You might not know this, but no current or future supercomputer is able to analyze and truly understand to very high accuracy all the interactions between all the electrons, the protons, and the neutrons inside that a fairly simple caffeine molecule. In fact, if we wanted to encode just the energy state of that caffeine molecule, we would need 10 to the 48 classical bits. That's about 10% of the atoms on the planet Earth, or a computer chip the size of the Milky Way galaxy. The same energy state can be encoded just using 160 quantum bits. And caffeine is not even that large compared to other molecules of interest, some of which are shown behind me. Pursued for decades in research labs, prototype quantum computers are rapidly emerging, with the prototypes getting larger and more capable. But the technology is generally not understood. We need to educate the quantum workforce of the future. 
as well as more quantum researchers and engineers to build and understand the hardware, we'll need even more quantum developers to write the software and applications that will run on them, and quantum trained practitioners to be able to effectively and efficiently use the machines. And that is one reason, two years ago, we created the IBM Q experience. We wanted to take quantum computers out of the lab and into the world to people like yourselves. The IBM Q experience was the first con public quantum computer and developer ecosystem. Anybody in the world can freely go online and access our 16 and 5 qubit devices and program fairly simple circuits on them using a drag and drop composer interface. Over here on your right, I have a bit of a schematic of what it looks like between the user's laptop and our quantum device. So we have the user's laptop, which could, is connected through the cloud to a classical, quantum a classical computing stack, which is then connected to our quantum chip, which sits at the bottom of a very, very special refrigerator. This refrigerator keeps our quantum chip at negative 270 degrees, no, 273 degrees Kelvin, colder than outer space, almost absolute zero. The conditions that are needed to be able to create these quantum bits and manipulate them to do our calculations. So here we have a very short animation showing a very simple circuit going from that user's laptop through the cloud to that classical computing stack that takes that very simple circuit, turns into a set of microwave pulses, takes those pulses to the quantum chip, which does the calculations, creates a couple of microwave pulses as output, which are then returned back to the classical computing stack and then sent all the way back to the cloud to the user's laptop. Here, the result is 1-1, one, one, otherwise known as the number 3. Uh, and this is a very simple circuit that you can run on this composer. But of course, to compute using quantum computers, we don't want just to be dragging and dropping gates and, and running programs that give you the number 3. And so uh, we've released Qiskit, which is an open source software development kit containing documentation, libraries, simulators, and access to our IBM Q devices. Our vision for Qiskit involves four fundamental elements, um, named after the, ele the fundamental Latin or Greek elements. We have Terra, the Earth element, for users wanting to program quantum computers at the level of, of microwave pulses and circuits kind of your assembly language of quantum computers. And on top of that, we have aqua, the water element, which allows people to run programs on a quantum computer without needing to know how a quantum computer works underneath it. Sort of like your higher level programming languages of, of, the, 50s, of the 60s and 70s, your C or your Fortran. Alongside that, we have Ignis, which is our fire element for researchers wanting to understand more about the noise and errors of our devices. And we have Air, which contains our simulators, emulators, and debuggers needed for us to understand how our quantum chips work. Our goal is to be accessible to as many people of different backgrounds as possible, from other researchers and scientists to teachers to general tech enthusiasts and developers. Since we launched the IBM Q experience in 2016 and Qiskit in 2017, more than 100,000 people from all around the world have logged on and run more than 6 million experiments between our simulators and real devices. And you just saw an animation of the number of users grow and from where they were from in the world. Building on the success of our IBM Q experience and Qiskit, last year, we launched the IBM Q network. Realizing that we couldn't do this alone, the IBM Q network is a collaboration of Fortune 500 companies, national research labs, and research institutions. We're combining all of our expertise together 
to advance quantum computing, expand the ecosystem, and find the first practical applications of quantum computing for business and science. As you can see, we have now an active network of hubs, partners, and members, and startups from all over the world, including financial institutes who are working directly with IBM, like JPMC and Barclays, as well as those working with our, Mizuho, I mean, with our Keio University hub in Japan, Mizuho Financial Group and Mitsubishi UFJ Financial Group. While you're on this slide, I'd also like to give a shout out to my alma mater, the University of Melbourne, where we just held an IVM Q Hub Network open house event last week to invite corporations from Australia to come collaborate with us as well, as well as Q Control, which is a quantum computing startup based here in Sydney at the University of Sydney. So when people start to collaborate with us, we take them through a training course. We teach them about quantum computing. We talk about our software stack. And then we think about what type of use cases and applications they can use quantum computing for in their industry. They can first test these out on our simulators and then run them on our commercial quantum computing devices. Currently, they have access to a 20-qubit device and we'll be upgrading them to a 50-qubit device in the future. 50 qubits is a very interesting crossover point in quantum computing hardware because it is at the crossover point of what we can simulate fully without making any assumptions on our classical computers today. And so we believe that sort of 50 to hundreds of qubits is where we'll be able to achieve quantum advantage. Quantum advantage being when a quantum computer will be able to solve a problem of interest to society faster than a classical computer. So currently, we have small, noisy quantum computers. And we believe that it will be useful to exp I mean, we'll be able to use these for useful problems in business and science. What type of applications could these be? So harking back to my caffeine molecule earlier, we believe that quantum chemistry is going to be one of the early applications of quantum computer, simulating quantum chemistry. Imagine if we could truly simulate the behavior of atoms and molecules, their energies and interactions. We might be able to discover new life-saving drugs in a fraction of the time it takes today. We could research and develop new, lighter, more efficient materials to improve the world around us. But moving on from quantum chemistry, interestingly enough, there are problems in the finance space that can be directly mapped to a quantum mechanical system. The most and best well known of, or the best well known of these is the Black Scholes Merton model, which you all probably know much better than a physicist than me. But the Black Scholes Merton model calculates the price variation of financial instruments over time and can be used for evaluating European options. But you might not know that you can directly map the equations behind the Black Scholes model to the Schrodinger equation. The Schrodinger equation calculates the time evolution of a quantum system over time, three time. People have even modeled entire financial markets as if they were a quantum process. And the, it's these successful applications of thinking about modeling financial systems as if they were quantum systems that lead us to believe that quantum computing will be useful for the finance industry. Now, just like quantum systems, financial systems tend to be too complex or too large to analyze deterministically. And currently in those situations, Monte Carlo sampling is used to understand a system's properties better by statistically sampling realizations of that system. In finance, 
uh, Monte Carlo it it tends to be used to understand a particular financial instrument's properties, be it a stock, a bond, or an entire uh, portfolio. So that it can be used for things such as risk analysis, per, uh, personal financial planning, risk evaluation, or derivatives pricing. However, depending on the distribution of the financial instrument of, of choice or the required accuracy of the result, we ne may need millions and millions of Monte Carlo samples to get our required answer. And sometimes financial instruments need to run the, their risk analyses overnight or day-long uh, stock market simulations using clusters and clusters of classical computers. Let me give you an example of, of an approach, something that a Monte Carlo approach would be used for. Let's say we have this particular um, profit and loss distribution of a stock. As a trader, you would definitely be interested in the expected future value of that stock. But of course, you want to be able to know the risk of your future investment, and so you'd want to calculate your value at risk, your approximate average loss. And you'd also want to understand your conditional value of risk, your tails of your losses. You know, if you do reach that 1 in 20 bad trading day, are you going to go bankrupt? And so if you were going to run a Monte Carlo sampling for this problem using a classical approach, let's say we're going to need a million samples to get our acquired accuracy. Using a quantum approach to the problem, Using amplitude estimation, we would only need around 10,000 samples. That's two orders of magnitude less, or a quadratic speed up. So here is indicative scaling of a classical um, solve time compared to a quadratic speed up in quantum solve time. And you can hardly see the quantum computing solve time in front of those classical bars. Imagine what this could mean once we have quantum computers large enough to solve these types of problems. We could maybe run those Monte Carlo simulations that currently take overnight or a tire day, perhaps in near real time. Perhaps. So we've actually run a couple of these simulations on our IBM Q devices. And you can come uh, to, and talk to us at the IBM Research Booth later this week if you want to learn more. Another approach to financial problems is to look for patterns in past data using machine learning techniques. And machine learning techniques have been used very successfully in areas such as trading, economic forecasting, underwriting, credit scoring, to name a few. However, sometimes the computational costs of such techniques can be prohibitive. Now, quantum machine learning is a very early and new area of research. And it's early days yet, but we hope that one day it may provide the tools to satisfy our growing data volume variety, and complexity. An example of a machine learning problem is a classification one. So let's say we have two groups of customers. We have our red uh, credit risky customers and our yellow credit worthy customers. And what we want to do is separate those two customers out into two groups. The way we do this sometimes in a classical computer is we try to find the customers at the boundaries of those groups so we can find a dividing line between them. So if we get a new customer, we know on what side of that dividing line they are on, if they are credit worthy or credit risky. And we want to find the largest separation between those two groups as possible because we don't want any false negatives or false positives. We don't want to accidentally give that home loan to that credit risky customer. However, how you look at the data can depend on whether you can find that separating line between groups of customers, between groups of data. So here, looking at this one-dimensional line, you can see that there is no way to draw a straight line between our red dots and our yellow dots, our credit risky and our credit worthy customers. However, if we look at the data in two dimensions, you can see now that it is possible to separate out those two groups 
and define that dividing line. Much of what we do in machine learning is looking at data in different ways to try to find that classification, to try to group them, to find members like them. Using, uh, using quantum computing, we're able to access different uh, dimensions of data that you can't in classical computing. We're trying to find a higher dimensional space that isn't available classically using those quantum mechanical uh, properties such as superposition and entanglement. We've actually implemented a couple of these algorithms in Qiskit Aqua, and I encourage you all to try to download it and test it out on your data today. So I hope I have conveyed to you all that quantum computing is real, and its impact to our world is eminent. We at IBM and other companies as well are building quantum computers today, and people are using them through the IBM Q network and the IBM Q experience. Now is the time to begin exploring what you and your companies can do with quantum computers. Think about it this way. If we were back in the 1950s and you all had had five to 10 years to prepare for the advent of the mainframe while it was still a prototype. You had five to 10 years to prepare to try to be and get that competitive edge over others. In hindsight, jumping in early would have been the right thing to do. That is where we are with quantum computing today. If you'd like to learn more about this topic, we have some fantastic talks on this stage this afternoon, and you can come talk to us at the IBM Research Booth anytime this week. Also, if you'd like to know a little bit about how quantum computing can affect our current security systems, come back here on Thursday for the SenseMaker session, where my colleague Tichilia will be talking about the future of cyber technology, cyber security, and piracy. Thank you very much for your attention. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks again. Brilliant, brilliant session. OK, that uh, wraps up this, the second SenseMaker of the week. Don't go anywhere, because our journey into the quantum, quantum realm continues in just a few minutes. Please take the time to add post-its uh, so that you give us your feedback on these sessions. And of course, we have the opportunity to meet all of our fantastic speakers at the end of the day, around 4.30, for the curated networking sessions. So we'll see you again in a few minutes. Thank you.